Hello and welcome to the beautiful campus of Newbold College in Berkshire, England. Founded in 1901, it was in 1946 that the college moved to this stunning location with its historic garden and new Tudor mansion. The original owner made his money in 19th century China. Thus, it is fitting that today's students in business, theology, humanities and English actually come from 60 different nationalities to gather to study on this campus. Let's head to the award-winning Grass Roof Church for a series of lectures conducted by Dr. Chris Blake. Chris Blake is a professor in English Literature and Communication from Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska. He is here giving a lecture over the topic, Searching for a God to Love. Today's topic, Living on the Edge. Now every once in a while, like virtually every day, I hear somebody say something, and during every sermon I think this, and I think my students think this as well often. It's a question we ought to ask more often. The question is, so what? So what? So what if you follow this Christian lifestyle? What does it bring or what should it bring and what's up with that? I know there are lots looking on right now who have uh, at least been tempted to say, forget about it and maybe given in to the temptation. Well, there are five reasons in the so what on living on the edge. I'm going to go through these with stories generally. Living on the edge, and once again, I'm going to go to the old school experience of writing on a whiteboard. I know it's very last millennium, but that's the way we're going to roll. The first so what that you experience is timeless time. In the book Screw Tape Letters, C.S. Lewis speaks through the voice of a devil about the need to keep these humans away from the present to keep them constantly either living in the past or the future. In the past, because it's of course filled with regrets and resentments. In the future, because in the future, then we never have to actually deal with the present. We're always putting things off. I don't have to be real now. I don't have to be transparent or authentic now in a later time. As Lewis points out, it's only in the present that we can hear the voice of God, that we can feel his breath on our skin. Jesus said in John 8, 58, I tell you before Abraham was, I am. And the great I am that he's talking about there in John 8, is not just the I was or the I will be, but that eternal present. You see, living on the edge is walking this knife edge of eternity that falls off to the past and eternity in the future. Every nanosecond we're on the edge. It's a magnificent concept The second one is fearless love. I mentioned last night, 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. To live fearlessly, what a wonderful, wonderful experience that is. I had a friend, Earl Davis, who has died, but Earl lived out fearless love like very few I've met. One day, Earl and his wife, Jean, were driving 
through Los Angeles. Now, you need to know this about Earl. Earl was uh, about this high, tall, sorry, and uh, uh, bulky, broad, always had a smile on his face, talked with everyone. Everyone was Earl's friend. You know, we choose our friends. We decide who our friends are. And even when others did not decide that, he would, as illustrated by this story. He and Jean driving through Los Angeles, and they got lost. Now they got lost, and they wandered around and wandered around until they recognized they were in a very dangerous part of the city. He pulled over. He rolled down his window, got out a map, and he started looking at the map, trying to figure out what was going on. In a few moments, a young man came up, stuck a gun at him through the window, and said, give me all your money. This is what Earl did. Friend, we're lost. We're trying to get to this place right here, this freeway, and I think we're here, but I'm not really sure how to get from here to here. And the fellow did this. Here's what you do. You just get over here, then you take that. Take a left right here, and then a right up here, and then you can get on. Now don't, don't turn left too fast. And Earl and he talked about it, got it right, and then he took off. Thanks so much, friend. Took off. Now, I'm not recommending that as a recipe every time that happens. However, I can tell you this, that I think that that young man felt that Earl was genuine. He understood, yes, he really is treating me as a friend. He's asking for help, and the young man gave it. And then Earl told me, after he told me that story, that about a mile later, he pulled over and stopped shaking, you know. Still, that fearless love captivated him. In Matthew 5.40, Jesus talks about that fearless love. I'm going to turn there myself. Sometimes people get up front and they've got, got everything right in front of you. You know what? I don't think that's 5.40. I think it's 25.40. Yep. Matthew 25, 40. It's a good thing I looked it up. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. And I did it in crayon, I can see. Well, how about that? <laughs> this is uh, the judgment scene, Matthew 25. You know, we tend to read the Bible through our different lenses. I'm a teacher, a professor. And I see Matthew 25 here as the final exam. This is Jesus' final exam. The sheep and the goats. Matthew 25, it starts the judgment in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, that's going to be quite a retinue. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And the conclusion is, in verse 40, the king will say, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Can you approach everyone with that love and then live fearlessly? The third one is trustworthy truth. Mm -hmm. A few years ago in the United States, if you sent a package overseas, and it was just, for example, books, it cost less than if you've sent a package with a letter in it. 
I was at the post office. I had a $20 bill. I was sending quite a few books to my friend Gary Krause, who was here not long ago. Gary Krause, who lived in Australia. I knew it would be kind of pricey. And I waited a long time. It was near Christmas. I was getting a little irritable, you know, sometimes when you're rushing around and you're waiting and you have to do something else. And I've got this money. And I came up to the woman at the counter. And I said, here you go. And she waited. And then she said this. Okay. Uh, is this just books or is there a note or a letter or something in there? Well, there was a note in there. And I said, why? She said, well, if it's just books, it'll cost $18.63. But if you've got a note in here, it's $26.31. I only had a 20. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to go back. So I stood there, you know, seriously, my ethics were paralyzed. And she said, let's just say it's books. <laughs> Stamped it, I gave her the 20, I walked out. She gave me change. And then you know what happened. I kept thinking about it. <clears throat> By the way, that's a good thing. It's good to keep thinking about that. I kept thinking about it because I tried to pay attention to that compass, that true north that we brought out that first night. Not all of this, remember? But that compass, that true north, which is God's voice, our conscience, Jesus, the Bible, true north. And I kept thinking about it and thinking about it until the next day I went back to the post office. And I waited until the line was clear in front of the same woman. Another line opened. I said, no, that's okay. I need to talk with her. Came up to her. I said, yesterday I was in here and I said there wasn't a letter in a package, but there was. And I didn't pay enough money. So here's an extra $10. Um, that ought to cover it. She said, sir, I can't take that money. I said, well, okay, I'll tell you what. My integrity is worth a lot more than $10. It's worth more than $100,000. I'm going to leave the $10 here. You can put it in the trash. You can put it toward your kid's education. Or you can throw a party for the rest of the postal workers but the $10 is staying. Thank you so much. And I walked out. And I tell you this story for a couple of reasons. The first is that we all struggle with telling the truth. We do it every day. You know you can tell a lie by not saying a word, by raising an eyebrow at the wrong time. Robert Louis Stevenson said, the cruelest lies are told in silence. I tell you that story because I want us to think about that true north. I tell you that story also because I think it makes me look pretty good. And I could tell you some others that don't. John 8, 32. <laughs> Start with 31. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Mm -mm -mm. The truth will make you free. Fourth one. is liberating discipline. Liberating 
discipline. So here's what happened. At 11 o'clock, I got up getting ready to teach world cultures to my class. And I told them, we have a new rule. Tell you what, this class period, I'm going to have you make all the rules. You decide. They were interested. We're going to have to vote on it. It's got to be democratic. Here we go. What do you want to do the rest of the class period? Now, I'm going to say this. It's got to stop at noon, and we're going to clean up and make sure everything's okay afterward. It's got to stay in the classroom. Those are my three rules. But other than that, whatever you want. Here we go. So I went to the board. What do you want? First rule. First fella raised his hand. Uh, Reggie raised his hand and said, you can chew gum. So I wrote it up on the board. Number one, you can chew gum. We had a rule against chewing gum because it was getting kind of thick under the desks, you know? Number two, guy raised his hand. You can put your feet on the desk. Okay? I had this rule that I wanted to see their souls, not their souls. <laughs> Number three, Jamie said, Jamie, by the way, was going with, in love with, in infatuation with Audra. And they were in the same class. And he said, you can hold hands. And of course I said, your own? <laughs> no, somebody else's. Okay, I'll put that up. You can hold somebody else's hand. We kept going four, five, six, seven. They started getting more creative more energetic, hands were going up all over the place. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then Eric said on number 13, you can do anything you want. I said, hey, this is where higher education kicks in. <coughs> hey, if we just vote on number 13, that'll take care of 1 through 12. The students were like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Let's just vote on number 13. Yeah. Okay. How many of you want for the rest of the class period to do anything you want to do? Raise your hands. And they rose, you know, two hands and legs were going up. I took my time counting them. Yes, it was unanimous. My young son used to say when he was four, we took a vote and it was anonymous. <laughs> Said, oh, that's good. This one was unanimous. I said, it was, it was 22 minutes to 12. A uh, time that will remain burned into my brain until the day I die. <laughs> I said, okay, here we go. So here we are. Now, teachers are weird. I wanted to teach world cultures. So I turned around, and I started writing on the board. And I said, okay, open your World Cultures book to page 87, whatever it was. And they started to reach under. No, nope, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> One guy put his feet up on the desk. Another guy got out some gum. And Jamie went over and sat on Audra's desk, took her hand, looked at me. I started talking to no one, telling them about world cultures. I like world cultures. Well, things started heating up. We had a sink at the back. A couple of guys got out some comet cleanser and a big sponge. They got the sponge wet. <laughs> they got in a little fight, you know. Another guy took an eraser, hit Kristen in the back of the head. Boom! She was trying to read a novel. <gasps> she threw her novel at him, you know? It's the only book he had touched all year. <laughs> Things really started warming up. 
people were shoving and laughing and doing all sorts of things. I mean, it was getting loud. I continued talking to no one. I was practiced at that. <laughs> Taking notes, talking to no one. When Leonard came up, Leonard came up to about here on me. He's the son of uh, what we call a literature evangelist. Um, somebody who goes around and sells books. And uh, he came up and uh, took an eraser. And erased everything that I had written. <laughs> I said, Leonard, please don't do that. He stood back with his eraser smiling, just waiting. I continued talking to no one, writing something on the board and in the middle of my writing, he erased that too. And the thought occurred to me, hey, I can do anything I want too. <laughs> now I say this to my shame because the best way to learn anything is to teach it. But as he was doing that, I took his wrist, and I was gently pressing him into the carpet. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and it said, the Holy Spirit, he said, the Holy Spirit, she said, what are you doing? Right in the middle of that. I remember this so vividly. I was just and then I yanked him up. I apologized to him. And it kind of shook me up a little bit. And I stood off to the side just to see what was going on. As I stood off to the side, I noticed that there was one fellow walking across the tops of the desks. <laughs> I noticed at the back, there were two girls, and they were putting transparent tape around my desk over and over and over. One of them, I performed her wedding. She's now a chaplain in a hospital. <laughs> I could tell you other stories about these kids, where they ended up, which I oh won't. Well. I, I would need to cut myself in to that tape to sit down. And in fact, that's what I did. I went back to the back, cut myself in, sat down, and I watched what was going on. And I saw the most amazing thing. I saw Danny. Danny, who is now a 7th and 8th grade teacher himself. I saw Danny going around, picking up things. Cleaning up. Picking up a desk. Cleaning the water and the comet off. Putting a poster that had been ripped down up. Going around, using his freedom to clean things up. That was astonishing. It was an act of maturity like few I've seen. Well, the last 30 seconds, they were all in their seats kind of quaking, you know? One guy was shooting a rubber band over and over at the ceiling trying to get his last bit of freedom in. <laughs> At 12, I said, okay, got up in front, that's it. We got to clean up, but first, we need to talk. I have a question for all of you. How many of you, in the past 22 minutes, got to do exactly what you wanted to do? I did this. Not one. I said, well, why not? We voted on it. Well, I wanted to read, and they kept hitting me in the back of the head with the racer. Oh, yeah, well, how about you and you? And then things started getting roaring, started to build. I said, okay, okay, okay. My next question. How many of you think we need rules? 
Two hands went up from everybody and some legs. <laughs> and to this day, if you talk to any one of them, they will say, yeah, we need rules. Because the rules set us free. We call those commandments in the Bible. In Galatians 5.1, you find one of my favorite verses. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. For freedom, you learn the scales in music so that you can have the freedom to play a sonata. Without that, no sonata. Hebrews 12 is a great chapter on discipline. By the way, Discipline and disciple have the same root. 12.7, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as children. What children? What child ignores the discipline? Final one is realistic hope. And there's no story to go with this one. There's just a text. And the text is not far away from that last text. Hebrews 9, verse 27. A wonderful text. Three chapters before. Realistic hope we have. starting there, and then 28. Just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment. Look at 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. And the writer then says something that stunned me when I first read it. It says, not to deal with sin. Christ doesn't come the second time to deal with sin because he's already dealt with sin. It's already dealt with. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Of what use is immortality to a person who has not learned to live half an hour? Not much. But when the way gets in us, when we live with that timeless time, that fearless love, that trustworthy truth, that liberating discipline, that realistic hope, oh, what a life it is. May you live it. The themes and topics explored in this series are from Chris Blake's book, Searching for a God to Love. For more information on how to get your copy, please visit searchingforagodtolove.org.uk.